Good morning, North Livingston. Good morning. All right, there we go. Uh, the girl of the hour has just arrived. She's changing, but we're going to go ahead and begin. Amelia just asked me, what's the plan? I said, I don't know. She said, well, just tell me where we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be there. I'm like, I don't know where we're supposed to be. So, But uh, this is an exciting morning. We get to, uh, this being the fifth Sunday, uh, we get to celebrate the uh, ordinance of baptism and the ordinance of communion. And so it's always exciting when we get to celebrate those. If you would stand, let's open our service with a time of prayer. As we pray this morning, we certainly want to remember Jim and Margaret. Jim uh, Holsapple got moved into um, assisted care living this week. Margaret is home uh, waiting five bypass surgery this coming Thursday. So remember Jim and Margaret, remember Joe and Tina as they wait upon them. Uh, remember Eric's mom, Marlene, they had to take her by ambulance this morning about three o'clock to the hospital. She's been admitted to the hospital and Logan is sick. So they're out today. Remember them, uh, Daryl and Patty are on the road, but Daryl is sick with strep throat. Jesse is home with strep throat. Uh, so let's pray for the many in our community that seems to be going around. Also, uh, remember Pam Perriman and Heather Hurley, both of them have surgeries coming up. So just pray for them as we have our time of prayer. Do you have other needs, requests? I want you to all to be in prayer for Hadley, Hargrove. She just continues to do seizures and she had a bad one yesterday. They had to take her to the hospital for Hadley. Please pray for Hadley that they can find out what's causing some way to stop this. One of the teens in our community um, that's having trouble with seizures uh, to understand uh, medication adjustments and troubles there. So just pray for the Hargrove family. Are there others? All right, let's go to the Lord in a time of prayer. Father, we thank you for this Lord's day. God, this uh, first day of the week that you've set aside that we as the church come together. God, we thank you for uh, the resurrection on the first day of the week for what the uh, church means, the family means. God, we just appreciate so much uh, the benefits and, and, and the privileges of, of a church family. God, we come to you this morning and, and we come with grateful hearts, thankful hearts. God, as we look around our world and our country, there's so much to be concerned about. And yet, Father, when we, we look about us, we can see there's still so much to be thankful for. And God, we would be remiss if we just didn't pause and say, we love you and we thank you for your many, many blessings that you've given to us. We thank you for the rain, God, how we've been needing that rain. Father, we appreciate the, the rain. God, we pray that you would just be with those that we've mentioned, those that need a healing touch. Uh, God, we know that Jesus took those stripes on his back, that atonement uh, included healing. God, we lift these names to you today, those that have surgery coming up, those that, uh, God, the families are just dependent on you. Uh, God, we, we, we're thankful for our doctors and hospitals and medicines, but God, we realize that you're the ultimate healer. And so God, we just depend on you. And we join our faith together with these families as we pray for these names that have been mentioned and the ones that are on our prayer list. God, many on our prayer list that are the families are bereaved today. God, we lift those families for your peace and your comfort. God, we just pray that you would just, just send the Holy Spirit to minister to them. Father, we pray for uh, Israel. We pray for the situation around our world. God, we pray for peace. Uh, God, we know that the scriptures tells us in the end times that there would be wars and rumors of wars and, and the earthquakes. And God, we see so many of these things happening. And God, we realize that there's, there's nothing left in the prophetic timeline that holds back your second coming and, and the rapture of the church. God, we just await that. And Father, we still ask that, that as we wait that time, God, that you would still, uh, God, we, we ask for your mercies. Uh, God, we, we know we're not, we're not deserving of your blessings. And even though you are so good to bless us, God, we, we ask for your mercies for our, our nation and for our leadership. God, we pray for our time together today. God, what a sweet time, what a precious time. God, I just pray for your anointing in all of it as uh, we conduct the service that it all be done to bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Uh, just a little housekeeping before we begin because uh, fall is always the busy calendar in the church. Uh, last week, we were able to take 85 
uh, backpacks to the associational office because of your generosity. And we thank you for that just coming off of our Eliza Broadus offering, which I think we exceeded the goal. We did 20, 2300, over $2,300 for the Eliza Broadus offering. You have been so good. And so now uh, we ask again, it's time for the Thanksgiving food baskets. And so you'll see that on the board, on, on the wall. And then also there's a paper in the back. It has the items, what we need to fill the food baskets. Of course, uh, in our community, there's such a need, will be a large need this year to distribute these food baskets for Thanksgiving. And so you'll see that list in the back of the items. Uh, as I said, a busy calendar. It's kind of slipped up on us with the uh, things happening on our calendar. It looks like we need to have all of these items here by Sunday the 12th. So that only gives us a couple of weeks. Uh, so as you're shopping, if you could pick those items up, bring them in, uh, we're gonna collect those up here to put the baskets together. And then that Wednesday night, the 15th of November, we will be putting the baskets together and delivering the baskets. So if you know of a family in our community in, in Crittenden, Livingston County, and in, in our area uh, that would benefit uh, from a food basket at Thanksgiving, if you would put their name and, and great, if you have their address, that would really help. And then put your name so that we can contact you if we need help reaching out and uh, put that in the box in the back. Just we're going to collect those names and that's who we will give those boxes to. Uh, remind you, coming up November the 19th, we have the concert here on Sunday morning and the fellowship meal uh, with Brother Eric Horner. Uh, the last thing I have on my item and then Miss Scarlett, you're on, uh, will be if you've ordered a t-shirt, uh, we need to get the money in for the t-shirts. Lauren has those and she's working them up now. And so if you've ordered a t-shirt or shirts, uh, if you have that money, you can give that to Joyce this morning. Joyce will have that information in the back. All right. I think that's all we've got on that list. So Miss Scarlett, where have you made it to by now? If you would make your way up. And Mom, if you want to come on up. Really easy now. Is it warm? Mm -hmm. All right. Step right down here. Be easy. There you go. Just sit down there. All right. How's that feel? Okay. Is that okay? All right. We're thankful for the family and friends that are here today for Scarlett. Scarlett is well known to the church. Uh, I think we have all prayed for Scarlett since we called her Baby Scarlett, not so much baby anymore. And her dad had nicknamed her Princess, and some of us kind of called her Princess Scarlett. But Scarlett, uh, after Vacation Bible School, began asking questions about being saved, being baptized. And uh, so a couple of weeks ago, I met with Scarlett in the office. We talked about baptism, what that means. We talked about being saved, and uh, Scarlett understood and so Scarlett prayed and asked Jesus into her heart, didn't you? All right. So having professed Jesus in your heart, where do you think Jesus is today? Hi. He's living in your heart. That's right. You've asked him to save you. You believe he did? All right. And so having asked Jesus to save you, Jesus in your heart, I'm going to ask you to put your hands on my wrist like I showed you, one under, one over. Just hang on tight, okay? And then, and then we'll do this real quickly, all right? You got a hold there? All right. Scarlett Jernigan, having professed your faith in Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Here we go. Ready? Hang on. There you go. Now you're baptized. All right. Praise the Lord. Real easy so you don't slip. Stand up and turn around back here. And mommy's going to get you with the towel. Got it? All right.
Good morning. What a service already, huh? Amen. Do we have any birthdays or anniversaries today? See none? Let's do a greeting this morning uh, as we sing Mansion Over Hilltop. Greet one another and just tell someone you love them and you're glad to see them in God's house today. Amen. Mansion Over Hilltop. service. Brother Danny, at this time, the church just wants to honor you. It's Pastor Appreciation Month, and we just, we want, I know we got a busy day today and everything, but we just want to uh, let you know that we love you, we appreciate you, and uh, we got you a little gift here. Okay. We've got a little presentation for you. So just sit down and take this in, brother.
Thank you, brother. We appreciate you. For just as, as time as this, uh, God has brought Brother Danny to us to, to lead this church and tell him that you love him today. And there's been some heavy hearts up here today. We just seem like we about cried all morning, but God is good to us. I mean, look what our service has already been. And uh, if you don't know the Lord today, if you've never claimed him and asked him to save you, I uh, pray that today would be that day. You know, we so miserably fail. I was confessing this morning uh, to the team that I seem like, and I even told Brother Danny to come in this morning, I said, I feel like I've failed every test in the last three weeks that I could possibly fail. But just a lot going on with her family, and, and I know that you are praying for my mom and, and praying for Jim and that transition, but but you know, in all that, God is still so good to us. Uh, he's in control. We try to take control. Uh, been trying to take some control from my mom this week and last week and the week before, and that ain't went very well. So, but I apologize for getting upset with my mom and everything. And I've, I've already apologized to her, but publicly I uh, confess that. But in all that, God is good to us, and I and, uh, wasn't real sure that we was going to do this song, but I think it would be very appropriate to do this song today with, uh, with all that's going on, with the, with the goodness of what we already seen this morning, and God's good to us. And uh, the name of this song is, and I'm really stepping out to do this song, especially up here, and I, Sister Donna's not up here, and Patty's not up here, and, but God's in control. And, uh, but this song is the goodness of God, and he is so good to us. And I don't know if I can get through it, uh, but we're going to try, okay? Amen. Goodness of God. is running. 
before you in your presence thanking you Lord for your presence thanking you Lord for what you've already done in our service today thanking you Lord that you are in control thank you Lord for all that's here today Lord, we just carefully want to lift up our voices to you today in praise song and acknowledging that you are in control. God help us to lay the things Lord, the storms that storm in our life. Help us to lay it down at the cross and claim the victory. Because Lord you are in control. Touch us today Lord. In Jesus name. you to turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter number three it will also the scriptures will also be on the screen but uh, I always encourage you to bring your Bible run along with me and make sure I'm doing the right thing up here saying the right thing always check the the preacher Matthew chapter number three so everybody got a communion cup now since the days of COVID we use the little individual cup and wafer unlike in the day of Jesus when they had the cup they shared in common and the bread they tore off and shared in common and Amelia says ew Matthew chapter number 3 as we've just commemorated with scarlet baptism and we get the example there from Jesus throughout the gospels the first thing that Jesus did when he began his earthly ministry now remember Jesus was a hundred percent God a hundred percent divine sent to be the sacrifice for our sins on the cross of Calvary but he was also and this is one of those things God does that I can't explain it. I just believe it by faith. And he was also 100% man. And so when we see Jesus in that man form, we see Jesus in the God form. And everything that Jesus did, we, we model our lives as Christians. We want to use that as an example. And we never will attain because he was 100% God. But because he was 100% human, we strive to be like Jesus. So the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they record the 
uh, the, the events in the life of Jesus. And in Matthew chapter number three, we find the story, the account of Jesus when he began that public ministry at the age of 30, around 30. And he went down to John. John was baptizing people. John would baptize people under his ministry. He was, he was the forerunner. John was the, the cousin of Jesus, about six months older than Jesus. And he was telling that this Messiah, this Redeemer was coming. And in Matthew chapter number three, we have Matthew's account of Jesus coming down to the, the Jordan River. J John was already baptizing people. And Jesus comes to where John is baptizing. And in Matthew 3 and verse number 13, Matthew records what he observed that day. He said, then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. But John tried to stop him, saying, I need to be baptized of you, and yet you come to me. And Jesus answered him, and the King James version of this says, suffer it to be so now. The, this translation says, allow it to be so, because this is the way for us to fulfill righteousness. And then John baptized him. In verse number 16, Matthew said, when Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water and the heavens suddenly opened for him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming down on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your word. God, I pray in these next few moments that you would uh, uh, allow the Holy Spirit to work through my voice to give us the message you have for us today. God, I pray that the Holy Spirit's anointing would show us the importance, the reason for baptism. God, let the Holy Spirit help us as we look at the communion, the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, all the same thing. But God, I pray that the Holy Spirit would help each of us today as we examine our hearts and our lives, just as Jesus instructed us for these ordinances of the church. God, I pray that this would be a day of renewal, a day of refreshing for each one that knows you as Savior. God, if there's one under the sound of my voice today that, that doesn't have that assurance, that doesn't know that they know that they know that they'll go to heaven when they die, God, I pray today that the Holy Spirit would convict them. God, that the Holy Spirit would show them of their need to trust you as their Savior, whether they're in the room or watching by way of internet. God, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, there are, in the Southern Baptist denomination, there's two ordinances of the church. I told you many times that I was raised in a church where we practice three ordinances. We also practice the ordinance of foot washing. Every time we would come together for uh, a... Um, Communion, the Lord's Supper, uh, at the end of that part of the service, the men would go to one room, the women would go to another room, and we would practice foot washing. Now, some churches, uh, they, they do that as an ordinance. The reason the Southern Baptist, Baptist Faith and Message, doesn't do that as an ordinance is because in, in, in looking at the Scripture, uh, all of the letters that Paul wrote to the church in the epistles uh, Paul talks about communion. He talks about baptism, but he doesn't talk about the foot washing. And so when we look at the foot washing, we see there as we look, uh, especially in the book of John, John spends quite a bit of time on this in John chapter number 13 on this, this foot washing and why some churches do that as an ordinance and some do not. And, and the teaching that Jesus was doing when he washed the feet of those disciples, one thing is you got to understand the culture that they lived in. Uh, men wore sandals. They had dusty roads. And so every time you would go into someone's house, uh, they would have servants in those houses. And what those servants would do, uh, as you came into the house, that servant would wash your feet uh, every time you came into the house. That was a, the job of a, of a hireling or a servant. And so Jesus, on this night of the, the Passover, the night before, the Thursday night before he's arrested and he's crucified on Friday, 
This is the, the last of the Passover meals that Jesus has celebrated, this, this communion or Lord's Supper. This is the last of the Lord's Suppers that Jesus would have commemorated three of these in his public ministry. And now he's having this last communion, this last Lord's Supper. And it was more than, than just what we commemorate. It's abbreviated what we do with the, the wafer and, and, and the juice. They had the whole Paschal meal, the whole Passover uh, lamb and, 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 and the no yeast and all of the, the, the bitter herbs. They had all of that. And at the end of that service, if you'll remember, John tells in great detail how Jesus stood up, took off his outer robe, took a towel, tied it around his waist, and he began to wash those disciples' feet. John even points out that he, was, he washed the feet of the one that would have, would have betrayed him. And then he comes to Peter, and John tells about that exchange between Jesus and Peter. And when Jesus comes to Peter, he, he kneels down, he takes the basin of water, he's getting ready to wash Peter's feet, and Peter says, you're not going to wash my feet. Peter was, was acknowledging, you're the king of kings, you're the Messiah, you're God's son, and, and, and no way I'm going to let you wash my feet. And Jesus made this proclamation to Peter, and John recorded it. He said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. And Peter said, not my feet only, but wash my whole body. And Jesus said, Peter, there's no need for that. And Jesus was teaching those disciples servant leadership. The importance for us to get from that foot washing is that in, in God's house, in God's kingdom, we are all saved by grace and we are nothing of ourselves and we're but servants in the kingdom of God. And as servants, we need to serve each other. We need to serve the world. And Jesus was saying, you got to get a hold of that before you can do anything else. You got to understand that we're, we're just servants. And Jesus was showing, if I'm a servant, you're a servant. We have deacons in the church. And, and, and a deacon, the, the whole definition of the word deacon is servant. Uh, the pastor as a shepherd, what that shepherd does the shepherd serves those sheep. The shepherd protects those sheep. The shepherd takes care of meeting those sheep's need. If a shepherd thinks he's better than the sheep and he's not gonna, he's not gonna protect the sheep, he's not gonna take care of the sheep, he's not gonna stay out where the sheep are, the wolves will get in and get the sheep. And so Jesus is simply showing servant leadership. And so while Jesus teaches the disciples that, it's this one-time event and so the, the, the Baptist doctrine doesn't take that as an ordinance. When Jesus gave the ordinances, now what an ordinance is, it's a, it, it's a rule, it's something that's, that's handed down as necessary, it's something that's given that it's, it's a command to do. And so the two commands that we interpret from Scripture that Jesus gives us is baptism. That's the first thing Jesus did in his public ministry. And so we do that to show that we're, we're following Jesus, the example of Jesus in that baptism. And then the second thing is this uh, communion, this Lord's Supper. Jesus, when he instituted the Lord's Supper that same night, Jesus says, as oft as you do this, as often. He didn't say you had to do it every week or, or every day or whether you do it every fifth Sunday, which we do here. He just said, as often as you do this. And so that was, that was the, the teaching that you're going to do this. And as often as you do it, you do it to remember what I've done for you. And we're going to talk a little more in depth on that in just a moment. But as Jesus was teaching these disciples, he was teaching about this servant leadership. When the, the two disciples, James and John, they, they were arguing that night with Jesus about which one of them should be on his right hand and which one should be on his left hand in, in the kingdom. Uh, James and John were thinking, you know, we're, we're here at the beginning of this. We're going we're gonna to see this kingdom thing through. And, and, and remember, they thought in their mind that he was going to be a, a, a political ruler. They thought he was going to overthrow the Roman government. He was going to fix everything with Israel back then. And Jesus was teaching them, my kingdom is not of this world. Matthew in chapter 23, Jesus tells them, he says, you're not called to be instructors. He's telling them, you're not called to do what I've done. In fact, he tells them, he says, the, the greatest among you 
is going to be a servant. And then he went ahead to tell them with James and John. He said, You're, I don't think you can do the, 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 the baptism that I'm about to partake of. And he wasn't talking about water baptism. He was talking about what was going to happen on the cross with his death and his resurrection. And so this water baptism is, is just a symbol to identify with Jesus. Peter, in, in, in 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter talks about salvation and baptism. Baptism does not save us. When Peter talks about salvation by baptism, he talks about baptism by the Holy Spirit. When you read all of 1 Peter, you see what Peter is saying there. He's talking about when, when you're baptized with the Spirit of God. We, we teach children when they get saved that you, you pray and Jesus comes to live in your heart because we can identify with Jesus. We've seen pictures of Jesus. We have an idea of what we think Jesus is. What really happens when we get saved, though, is the third part, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. That's what moves into our heart. And so that's why when we baptize somebody... We baptize and, and always, as a preacher, uh, my prayer is, as I'm baptizing someone, and you just heard it, I baptize you, my brother, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Because when Jesus was baptized, as we've seen there in Matthew chapter number 3, when Jesus was baptized, he came straightway up out of the water and when he came up out of the water, the heavens opened. And, and I, think, I think I said Matthew there. It's, it is Matthew. All, all the gospels record that. But Matthew records it that he, he said that the, the heavens were open and Jesus saw the Spirit of God. Now you've got Jesus the Son and you've got the Spirit descending like a dove. And then you hear the voice of the Father. So you've got the Trinity. God the Father speaks and says, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. And so that's why when we baptize in water, we baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is present at the baptism. It, when you see the, the importance and the significance of what we just did here this morning, I was standing at the edge of that baptistry this morning when Amelia went and turned the hose on. There's a hose that comes in here and they, they turn the water on. And when she turned the water on, I'm standing at the end of the baptistry. You know what happens to a garden hose when you turn it on in the yard and you don't have a hold of the end? I could have said I got baptized. I got wet. But that's all I did was got wet. Just like if you were standing out in the rain, you got wet. But when you baptize as an ordinance of the church service, you see it's instituted in the church, an officer of the church, the preacher, the deacon, an officer of the church performs that baptism because it's an ordinance of the church. Now, most of the time what accompanies that is church membership. That's going to be different this morning because Scarlett and Ben and Kim live in another community and, and they're going to be plugged into their church. But Scarlett wanted to be baptized in this church because this church has meant so much to her family with Buddy and Amelia. When she wanted to be saved a few weeks ago, she told her mama, I want to go talk to Brother Danny. And I hope the girl that was over vacation Bible school, Lauren, is there. And then I want to be baptized in, in Aunt Mimi's church. And so that's why we baptized her here this morning. But it was an ordinance of the church. It, it's, that's why when Jesus did that, when Jesus was, was baptized, and, and, and churches do this different ways, there's different ideas. But when you look at what Scripture teaches, when Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. He wasn't sprinkled now, there's denominations, and I don't, I'm not here to make anybody mad. I'm just here to say why we do what we do and because of what the Bible says. I'm around people. You, I, you know, I'm around the Amish all the time and, and, and driving for the Amish. And the Amish, they practice sprinkling baptism. I've discussed this at length with them. Why do you sprinkle? I mean, I would think if anybody would dunk, it would be Amish, but they don't. They sprinkle. And, and some of our other sister churches, they sprinkle. The Baptist faith and message and what we believe, what I grew up believing is what the Bible says. He came up straightway out of the water. 
I always tell them, if I don't get your nose wet, you're not baptized. I, I've, I've told the story before when we were at Second Baptist about baptizing Cody Heron. And Cody's about this much taller than I am. And when I got him in that baptistry, that's one of the baptistries you have to get in with them. And you remember me telling the story about when I started to baptize Cody, I was in there by myself and this big old tall gangly guy and, and his feet started to slip out from under him. And he fought me in the baptistry and I didn't get his head all the way under. And I kept pushing and pushing until I got him all the way under. And by the time we were through, everybody was laughing out there. But you see, I'm, I'm, I'm a believer. If you don't get your nose wet, it hadn't happened. I don't believe in sprinkling. And, 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 and to each his own, if you're from a church or your church teaches sprinkling, and you can justify that scripturally, so be it. But what I see in the scripture is when Jesus was baptized, he came up straightway out of the water, which means he went into the water. If we look over in Acts chapter 8, when Philip went to the chariot where the eunuch was, and Philip baptized the eunuch after he believed in Jesus Christ, he was saved. And then when he baptized him, after he believed with his heart that Jesus was the Son of God, and he asked God, he asked the, that he be saved because of what Jesus did on the cross, it says that he saw water and he said, what prevents me to be baptized? And you'll remember the scripture says in Acts chapter number 8, they went down into the water. And it doesn't, it, it leaves no room there that he could have just sprinkled him. It says that he baptized him. He went down into the water and when they came up out of the water, when Philip lifted him out of the water, the spirit of the Lord, the same spirit that came down on Jesus and, and, and the voice from heaven said, this is my son. When, when the eunuch was baptized, when they came up out of the water, it says the spirit carried Philip away. He just disappeared he was, however the Lord does that, however they, they could do that, God could do that the way we see in science fiction movies. He was just moved from that spot to another spot and when he was delivered over there, he started preaching again because the spirit was present but he came up out of the water. So when, you, when, when you're baptized, it's not sprinkling. Now here's the other thing. You don't have to be baptized. Now, you would think a preacher would say, well, you've got to be baptized. You don't have to be baptized to go to heaven. Now, it's an ordinance of the church, and if you have an opportunity to be baptized, I strongly encourage that you be baptized because that's, that's following Jesus. It's the first act of obedience you can perform in, in obeying the, the model of what Jesus did. But when you see the thief on the cross... You don't have to be baptized. To, baptism, that points that baptism does not save you. What Scarlet did here this morning was to show God and this house full of witnesses what she had already done two weeks ago in my office. And that was when she said, God, I'm a sinner. Would you forgive me of my sins and save me? And as soon as she prayed that prayer, the Holy Spirit came into her heart. Her name was written in the Lamb's book of life. And the Bible says there was a party with the angels in heaven. I believe her papa and her mimi, I, I, people, I, I believe Brother Allen, I, I believe there was a party in heaven and I kind of think he was leading it because that great grandbaby had gotten saved. But you see, the water baptism is not what saves you. The thief on the cross, they, they were mocking Jesus right up before they all died. And the one thief was, was mocking Jesus and this thief said, we deserve what we're getting, but he doesn't. And the other thief, the, the one thief kept accusing and making fun of and mocking. But this thief, he began to believe that what they said about Jesus was true. And he had a conversation with Jesus while they were both hanging on a cross. And you'll remember that conversation and, and he asked would you forgive me? If you are the son of God, his faith wasn't even sure. If you are the son of God, I've told you the story of my dad and how he was saved. My dad was what they call an agnostic. He didn't know if there was a God or not. The preacher came and sat down and talked to him and she, she had a lady preacher 
Tell you where I come from, right? And, and she came to our house. I'll never forget her sitting down in the living room. And she said, Carl, if, if you'll just do me a favor. Now, she didn't know a whole lot about my dad. And I've told the people of this church before, he had a fourth grade education. He couldn't read. But she challenged him. She said, if you'll read the book of John, and after you read the book of John, if you don't believe there's a God, I'll leave you alone. And my dad, with a fourth grade education that couldn't read, but he was successful in running his own business, he would have me to sit down every Wednesday night and read the Crittenden Press to him. Two reasons. He couldn't read it, and he wanted to make sure I learned to read. And so my tutor book was the Crittenden Press every Wednesday night, reading that to my dad. But somehow, divinely, miraculously, over a period of several weeks, God somehow helped my daddy read the book of John. A man that couldn't read, but he read the book of John. And driving down the road in a log truck, he wasn't in a church, he wasn't at an altar, but driving down the road in a log truck and he prayed like the thief on the cross, God, if you're real, would you save my soul? And he was gloriously saved. I saw such a change in that man when I was 12 years old. No doubt that he was saved. The, the, the faith of that thief on the cross, if you're the son of God, and Jesus said this day. Now, those Roman soldiers didn't let him come down off a cross and go get baptized in the Jordan River. There was no opportunity for him to be baptized. So baptism doesn't save you. It's just an act of obedience. What saves you is recognizing I'm a lost sinner. We're all sinners. Romans chapter 6 tells us we're all sinners. And the wages of sin is death. And Jesus is the only way. He's the door. And so we ask God to forgive us based upon the work of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. And when we pray that prayer, the Holy Spirit saves us. God saves us and the Holy Spirit moves in our heart. Paul said in Ephesians chapter number two, he says, you're saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves. It's God's gift, not from works, so that no man can boast. The grace of God, the love of God, and what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary is what saves us. Paul goes ahead to say in verse number 10 of Ephesians two, we are his workmanship, we are created in Christ Jesus when we're born again. We're created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Paul told Titus, he said, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. When, Paul, when, when Philip took that eunuch down into that water, many of your translations, Mike and Gail, Hear this, many of your translations leave a verse out. But the King James has a verse in there. And that verse that is so important that's in there is when Philip asked the eunuch, if thou believest, do you believe? Do you believe Jesus Christ was God's son? Do you believe he died on the cross of Calvary to pay your sin debt? Do you believe he didn't stay dead, but he rose on the third day? And if you believe that, all you've got to do is say, I believe. It's the ABCs of salvation. I admit I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross. And the C is I confess, God, would you save me? That's what Scarlett did in the office two weeks ago. And what you saw this morning was the evidence of what she did. And that little girl understanding at the age that she is of seven and a half, I don't know how many times we prayed that little girl to snatch her back from death's door. And this morning, what happened two weeks ago, we recognized and commemorated this morning, she's gonna live forever with Jesus in heaven because of a decision she made two weeks ago. Praise God. You don't have to be baptized to be saved. You're saved by faith. You're saved by what Jesus did on the cross, just like the thief. That's why we don't baptize infants, because you have to reach the age of accountability where you understand what you're doing. Some churches believe you can baptize an infant and that's going to save them forever. That's not what 
Peter was talking about when Peter says you're, you're saved by baptism. As I said a while ago, he's talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. When you're born again, the Holy Ghost moves into your heart immediately. The Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart when you're born again. And Peter's talking about that. So it's not like you have to, to baptize a baby in order for them to, to make it to heaven. That, we, we have baby dedication services. I love baby dedication services. We, we, we dedicated both of our girls when, the, when they were just little babies. But that wasn't for them. That was for us. That was us making a commitment to God that we were going to raise them in the fear and the nurture and the admonition of the Lord according to what the Word of God says. And we tried our best to do that. And we did that believing what the Bible says, train them up in the way they should go. And when they're old, they'll not depart. Now, I believe there's another part to that. Sometimes they do depart. But if you've trained them in the fear and admonition of the Lord... And you pray for those babies because I don't care if they're 34 years, 40 years old, they're still your babies. And you continue to pray for them. I believe God's going to bring them back. I'm trusting with everything within me that he's going to bring them back. So they're not baptized as an infant, but we do dedicate babies when they're little, when they're infants. We dedicate them that we're going to raise them in the name of the, in the, the fear and admonition of the Lord, the way the Bible teaches that we should raise them. Now, communion. When... when Joan, I'm trying to get to the point. Man, time's flying by. Communion, you've got your little cup. The reason we do communion is because on the night that Jesus was arrested, Jesus had that, that supper with those disciples. And Jesus said, as often as you do this, because what Jesus wanted them to remember was just how that process of salvation works. He was about to, he was about to show them how that process of salvation works. It went all the way back to Exodus. It went all the way back to when the Israelites, the, the Hebrew children were brought out of, out of that slavery in Egypt. We've talked about that at length in the last few weeks and how they had to take that perfect lamb, that lamb that was without blemish and they had to sacrifice that lamb. And for some 3,000 years, Men tried and tried to get to God, to sacrifice, to fix things, to reach God. And the sacrifice was never enough. But it was a picture that sacrifice had to happen. It was a picture of what happened in Genesis chapter 3. It was a picture that something has to die to satisfy a righteous God's judgment against sin. That's why the Bible says in, in Romans chapter 6, the wages of sin is death. And so all the way back in Genesis in the garden when, when Satan came in and Adam and Eve sinned and, and they tried to cover their sin with the, the clothes that they had made of fig leaves and God came as was the custom to walk with Adam in, in the cool of the day and he said, Adam, where are you? And Adam was hiding and when Adam came out, he had on these fig leaves where Eve had, had made him some clothes out of some fig leaves and, and I think God probably snickered at that. God probably said, what are, you, what are you doing trying to cover up your nakedness? How did you even know you were naked? And the, you know the conversation that, that they had listened to the devil and sin had came in and, and God said, in order to cover your nakedness, in order to, to cover this, something's got to die. And so an animal had to be slaughtered and the skin had to be taken to make them close. The first time something had had to die. And throughout the Old Testament, sacrifice is made to try to satisfy that judgment against sin never was enough until there was a perfect sacrifice. Now, God had that plan made all the way back at the foundations of the world. He knew that the only sacrifice would be himself, his son, the form of his son coming to this earth. And so that's what Jesus is about to do on the night of the Passover, the Thursday night before he's arrested. And he says, this cup... This, this, this cup contains juice. It, it, it contains the fruit of the vine. And he said, that represents my blood. The disciples didn't understand at the time. It was sometime later that they figured out after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, after the ascension, 
after the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and filled Peter on the day of Pentecost that those men were able to look back and they were able to figure out this is what he was telling us. This is what he was teaching us and they wrote it down in the word of God for us. Paul tells us in, in, in the, the letter he writes to the Corinthians, Paul says, I, I got this from the Lord. I wasn't there with the disciples and the apostles. I came along later, but the, the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, he showed me and so he writes to the Corinthians what Jesus had said, this, this juice, this fruit of the vine. And, and you know what Jesus said about that? He said, as often as you drink this, you drink it to remember that I spilled my blood, the last drop of my blood on the cross of Calvary. And you know what else he said? He said, I'll not drink of it again. I'll not drink of it again until I'm with you in the kingdom, that day is not very far away, brothers and sisters. Everything we're seeing happening in our world today, everything you're seeing happen on the news today, it's pointing to what Jesus said 2,000, a little over 2,000 years ago, I'm gonna come again. And when I come again, I'm gonna be the king of kings. I'm not coming as your savior this time. I'm coming as your judge and I'm coming as your king and I'm gonna set up my kingdom. And then, then I'll drink of that again, but not until that day. But until that day, you drink a representative of this. And every time you drink that juice, you remember the blood that I spilled. He said, this, this bread, this wafer, what we, what we use is the wafer because it's un, unleavened. There can be no, no yeast in the bread. That goes all the way back to Exodus. He said, every time you, you eat this bread, I want you to remember my body that was sacrificed for you. And so Paul comes along and he says in, in 1 Corinthians, he says, what, what Jesus showed me, what Jesus taught me about this, what Jesus told those disciples back in the gospels about this, is every time you eat that bread, you need to examine your heart. Have I confessed all of the sin, all of the known sin that's in my life? I sin every day. There are times when I, you're a preacher, how do you sin? Somebody cuts me off in traffic and I get so angry at them. That's a sin. My wife doesn't do something just like she's supposed to do. She'll tell you she's perfect, but she's not. And sometimes we, we have spats, don't we? And we have to go to opposite ends of the house. We have to put ourselves in time out. We have to repent because that, that's a sin. You see, we're not perfect in this flesh. And so Jesus says, when, when you partake of this communion, you examine yourself. Now I make a little light of that, but it's really serious what we do. Some of us have things in our lives that are hangups and addictions and we're really battling those things. God knows that. And so when we come before God, we come admitting we're a human. And we're not perfect, but we recognize that Jesus was our perfect sacrifice. And when I take that cup and when I take that wafer, I'm reminding myself, he's reminding me, the word of God is reminding me the price he paid so I could say, God, I'm a sinner. Would you save me? And Paul says, you make sure that you're worthy. He told them in, in the Corinthian church, he said, when you come in to do this, he said, you're doing it just like you do any other church fellowship meal. And some of you are, are eating till you're full and you're eating in front of other people and you're taking food away from the needy. He said, you're missing the whole point, church. He said, the reason you do this is to remind you of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, the price that was paid for your sins. And so he said, you examine your heart. You examine yourself. And if there's any sin in your life, and there always is, you confess that sin before God and you say, God, would you forgive me based upon what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary? And this juice reminds me of the blood that he shed. This bread reminds me of that body that was nailed to the cross. But you know what else it reminds me of? It reminds me that he didn't stay dead. 
It reminds me that on the third day when those women went down to that tomb because they were going to embalm their dead friend and they got there and that stone had been rolled away and he wasn't there. And Mary looked in and Mary came out and Mary saw who she thought was the gardener. And when he said, Mary, when he called her name, she recognized who he was and she wheeled around and through her tears, she said, Rabboni, teacher. She said, oh, she, she immediately knew who he was. And he said, Mary, don't touch me. I haven't gone back to the father yet. This body's not glorified. But Mary, you go into town and you tell the men that I'm alive. And she ran back to town and she told the story of what had just happened. I've seen Jesus and he's alive. And Peter and John took off running and John outran Peter and they got to the tomb and they looked in and they saw the folded rags. And sometime in the next 40, 50 days, sometime as we fast forward that story, Sometime as they saw all that he did in those, those days that he was here on the earth before he was ascended back to heaven. The day the Holy Spirit came 10 days later and filled all of them in the upper room. I think they looked back and they remembered he told us every time we drink of that cup, every time we eat of that unleavened bread, it's to remind us what he just did for us. And it's to remind us He's coming again. He's coming again. So I'm going to ask you to take your cup. And before we open the cup, I want to have a prayer with you. God, we thank you for our time together. God, we thank you for these ordinances of the church. God, there's not a person in this room today that's here by accident, happenstance, or coincidence. But God, you foreordained that every one of us would be present in this room today. So God, I pray right now that as we examine our hearts, God, if there's one under the sound of my voice that doesn't know you in the full free pardon of sin, as the Holy Spirit convicts them, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you don't know that you know that you know where you'll go when you die, if you would just pray this prayer right now, if you believe Jesus was the son of God and that he died on the cross, and if you just pray this simple prayer, God, I know I'm a sinner. Everybody's a sinner. And God, I know the need for salvation. And God, I believe Jesus was your son. I believe he died on the cross to pay the penalty of my sins. And I believe he didn't stay dead, but you rose him on the third day. And because I believe that's faith, God, would you forgive me of my sins, past, present, and future? And as soon as you pray that prayer in faith believing, 1 John says that God will forgive you of your sins and you'll be eternally saved. God, the ones that are under the sound of my voice right now, that they know they're going to heaven, they know they're a Christian, but God, we know we have sin in our lives. God, right now, I pray that you would turn the searchlights of heaven into our souls. Illuminate our hearts and our minds and help us to, to see where we failed you. God, we may have failed you in just not being in church. We may have failed you in, in how we treat other people. We may have failed you in how we treat our, our spouse. But God, right now, I pray that the Holy Spirit would convict us and God, as we're convicted, God, that we would ask you to forgive us. God, forgive us our sins, just as Paul told us to, so that as we commemorate and participate, we would do it with a clear conscience. And it would remind us of what Jesus has done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd take your cup, well, I've got a problem up here. Bring me that towel. Sorry about that. Has it stopped? No. Well, 
What's happening? If you'll take your cup and peel back the paper revealing the wafer. <laughs> Jesus took the bread and he broke it. He distributed it to the disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. David, would you pray the blessing over our bread? And they took the wafer and they ate it. And then as you take your juice and again peeling the paper back. And they had a cup that was a common cup. And he told them to take the cup and to drink it. This represents his blood. Larry, would you ask the blessing on the juice? And they took the cup and they drank it. And then the scripture says they sang a song and they went out into the night. So Joe, I'm going to have you go ahead and come up. We're going to sing a song. And then before we're dismissed, I'm going to have Scarlett come back up.
we need to be praying for Brother Danny for nosebleeds. So let's pray for him, remember him. And at this time, Miss Scarlett, would you come up, please? Can I have a hug? We have this beautiful little girl that come to know Jesus Christ. And because of that, the church is going to be honoring her, giving her a Bible that has her name and certificate that she has accepted Christ as her Savior and has been baptized. Miss Scarlett, this is for you. Amen. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. Go back. And at this time, we're going to ask everybody to come up. And we're going to shake Miss Scarlett's hand. And before we do, Brother Buddy, would you lead us in prayer for Brother Danny, for one thing, for healing, and for the beautiful gift of salvation for Miss Scarlett. Thank you. 